If you can't tell by this beautiful sign that we have on the front of the stage, we're going to be spending the summer in the Psalms. So who's excited about that? You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I am super excited about it. And uh, if you want a companion for the summer, uh, in the seats in front of you, there's a new Bible journal. Uh, this is uh, for the book of Psalms, so please take it. It's, it's all 150 Psalms. It has devotions along with it, as well as place to take notes and, uh, and journal alongside. So please grab one of those, use it uh, as your companion throughout the summer. But I'll also say this, there are 150 Psalms, and we are about halfway through the year, and so if you start reading a psalm a day from now until the end of the year, you will cover the whole book of Psalms, which is pretty cool. So if you're wondering, like, man, I really want to get into the Word. I want to, like, like find a way to, like, get into the Word. Psalms is a great place to start. Uh, some of them are very short. Some of them are a little bit longer, but most of them are pretty short, and so they're great to just, like, open up each morning and just read for a few minutes and then meditate on uh, throughout your day. So uh, take these, uh, these Bible journals with you. And, uh, and really um, embrace using them. Uh, we are going to be on page 159 uh, and 158. Uh, and uh, it's Psalm 88 is what we're going to be looking at. So if you have your regular Bible with you, you can turn to Psalm 88. Uh, but if you want to uh, follow along in the, in the Scripture Journal, go to page 158. That's where Psalm 88 is. And, uh, and we're going to read this. We're going to unpack it. And uh, we're going to just in, uh, enjoy it in all of its splendor today. Uh, so I uh, hope you guys are, uh, are uh, ready because it's, it's a psalm, you know. Uh, so here we go. Uh, psalm 88, starting in verse 1. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths, your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors, and I am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long I am surrounded, or they surround me like a flood, and they have completely engulfed me. You have taken me from friend and neighbor, and darkness is my closest Friend, can I get an amen? All right. Uh, so, um, so that's a psalm. Uh, many of us, we we think of the psalms, and we think of psalms, we think of these jubilant uh, poems or songs of praise, and um, and we often forget, and we often miss the fact that a large portion. Um, of the psalms, one third of the psalms are actually lament, and this is uh, that lament in all of its glory. 
Um, I, think it's, I think it's really interesting as we look at this, though, because I think it really has a lot to say to us. And so I'm going to try and unpack this best I can, okay? Verses 1 and 2 are really key verses. In fact, we're going to uh, learn and memorize verse 1 together before the end of the day. That idea that um, the Lord, you are the God who saves me day and night, I cry out to you. We're going to learn that together before we leave here today because that is a verse we all need to take to heart. That, that our God is a God who saves. This, this psalmist uh, is speaking about God as a rescuer. He's speaking about God as a God of salvation and a God who uh, brings people out of captivity. Uh, this is likely because the psalmist has either experienced God's rescue in his life or has heard of God's rescue and what God does. My guess is it's actually that he heard of God's rescue. And, and the rescue that he heard of was when these Israelites were um, in Egypt. And, um, and God goes to Moses. Some of you guys know this, Exodus chapter three, right? In the burning bush. And he, and he, and he tells Moses, I'm gonna send you back to Egypt and you're gonna proclaim to let my people go because I have heard the cries of my people, the cries of their affliction. And I'm going to rescue them. I'm gonna bring them out of slavery, out of captivity into a land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm gonna raise them up to be this great nation that will bless all people. This is the idea of what God does when he rescues the people out of Egypt. And so this psalmist, he knows God is a God of rescue and he rescues when people cry out to him. When we cry out to God, that's when he shows up. He hears our cries and that's when he's moved with love and compassion to come and rescue and save. And so that's really the heart behind verses one and two is right there. And then we, we get to verses 3 through 9a, and this is really where we hear the heart of what's going on in the heart of the psalmist. This is where we hear what's really going on and the angst that the psalmist feels, this experience that he's going through that he compares to death and to being thrown into the deep depths um, of Sheol, which is the grave. And, um, and this idea of... Uh, and, and, and likely what this is, is, uh, you know how we sing songs uh, and we sing them with like a, uh, the, the word I, right? Like, I love you, Jesus, right? Oh, how I love you, right? We want, we want to sing a song that like expresses this is what I feel or this is what I think or this is what I say, but we sing it communally as a church. Uh, likely this is a song of exile, so what, what has happened is that this person and these people are experiencing exile and they're, they're, they've written this song and this psalm as a response to their feeling of being led into exile and being separated from God and what that feels like. And so in this sense, he is, he's giving us a picture and he's singing a song of being and experiencing this, this moving away from God, being taken out of God's presence. See, the, 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 the land, Jerusalem, the promised land, that was everything. To be taken out of that meant, like I've been taken out of the presence of God. I've been taken out of the favor of God. I've been taken out of the goodness of God. I've been taken out of the promises of God. And so to be separated from that felt like I've lost everything to these people. And so they're proclaiming this through this psalm, and it's a really, really deep, meaningful thing. However, he talks about the fact that this is a, this is a result, and this is what God is doing to express his wrath. Now, that word wrath scares us, doesn't it, if we're honest, right? Thinking of God as a God of wrath and, and, and those kinds of things. And I think what, this, what, what, what it means is this is God's punishment to his people. Because God loved them so much that he rescued them out of slavery. He rescued them out of captivity. He rescued them out of this place of where they needed rescue. And then they just chose to follow other gods. And they chose to go their own way. And they chose to make other things more important and more valuable and more, um, more the desire of their heart than him himself, than the God who loves them and who rescued them. 
And so the punishment for that is, well, you don't want to be with me. You don't want to have anything to do with me. You don't want me to be your God. All right, I'll put you under the oppression of someone else. And then, um, so they're led into exile. And this is the heart of, of a believer who's separated and far from God or feels far from God in this moment. Verses 9b through 14, they really express questions. Anyone ever have questions for God? Am I the only one? Okay. Uh, so like, like he's, he's expressing these heartfelt questions that he has for God. And he's, he's expressing his doubt. He's expressing his, his like, God, like, I don't know where you're at. Why aren't you listening? Why aren't you showing up? I've been crying out to you all the time I come before you every morning. Where are you at? Right, it's these questions that almost actually challenge the nature and character of God. And, uh, and, and man, it is just this, this is this like raw and just, I'm gonna lay it all out there and let God deal with these questions kind of situation. The only problem is these questions go unanswered. He's laying out these questions, but he never feels like he hears an answer. Anyone else ever felt that way? Yeah? Like, man, like, God, how did you let that happen? You just don't feel like you're getting the answer. And, um, you know, it's just a, just a beautiful, beautiful thing to find a companion that also feels that way within the Scripture. Um, and then verses uh, 18 through 18 go into this idea of coming back to the idea that um, darkness is where I live. It's my only companion. Darkness is what my life is filled with. It's not a happy ending. <laughs> and, um, and so how do we wrestle with this, right? How do we wrestle with something so raw and so honest that's such a struggle that tends to even question the character and nature of God and doesn't end with some sort of happy ending? Because this is God's inspired word, right? The spirit is working in this lament. And so, but, but how? And, and, and what, do we, what do we take away? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda just offer some suggestions on, on what this could mean for us personally. Um, because again, I think, I think this psalm expresses a deep angst within the writer. Um, that, that has to do with their relationship with God and feeling far from God. And, um, and I think there's something to be um, applied to our own lives in that. The first thing I think is really interesting is just the nature of lament, the nature of crying out to God with lament. Not too long ago, uh, we did a prayer practice as a church. Uh, some of you were here for that. Some of you experienced that. We did that within our life groups where we got together and we, we studied what it looks like to really be committed to prayer and, um, and, and pour out our hearts in prayer and practice prayer uh, in a healthy way. And one of the weeks we talked about the idea that prayer um, is oftentimes or can be a lament that there is a space for lament in our prayer if we want to truly come before God like with a, with a pure heart. And, uh, and I can remember being in my living room with my life group and we decided to take 30 minutes, our last 30 minutes together as a life group and pray. Um, and we were just working through these different forms of prayer and it, I was the last person to go and it had gotten all the way around to me with zero laments. We don't like to lament. We don't know how to lament. We aren't comfortable with lament. We're really comfortable to pray to God and say, God, bless your name. You're so great and you're so awesome and you're so mighty, so grateful for all the great things you've done. And we should do that, but we are not comfortable going to God saying, hey God, I got a problem with you, bro. And we should be okay with that because he's okay with that. He will not reject you in that. He, he brings it into his word. 
that this expresses the heart of someone having a relationship or wanting or desiring to have a relationship with God. There is nothing that you can't say to him. There's nothing that you can't bring before him that is going to cause him to reject you. As long as it's with a pure heart. As long as you're just expressing the true nature of where you're at and what you're going through. Accuse him. He can handle it. He's God. He'll squash your accusation real fast. But he wants you to bring it. He wants you to come with whatever you have. And so many of us are just faking it. So many of us show up at church and we fake it. And we show up at work and we fake it. And we get on social media and we fake it. And some of us in this room right now, we're dealing with dark stuff. We're dealing with depression and anxiety and despair and grief and loss and mourning and anger. And we just show up and we fake it. Because, because we aren't comfortable going to God and saying, God, I can't believe you let this happen. Depression and despair, angst, struggle, grief, loss, these are all products of humanity. These are all products of living in the world we live in. Believers and non-believers alike are going to experience them. We need to become aware of the fact that God isn't going to reject us because we feel this way. But we need to like, come to him with a pure heart and lay it out there. Deal with the grief and the loss. Deal with the pain. Deal with the struggle. Deal with the anger. And there's no better place to wrestle with those things than with God. And I would even go so far as to say there's no better place to wrestle with those things with God and with a community of people who love and are following God because God can be manifest in that community. And you need to have some people who reflect the image of Christ and who are living and becoming more like Jesus in your life that you can express these things with, say these things with, deal with these things with who aren't going to reject you or despise you. You know, um, I, we were, we were talking about this, uh, this passage together as a team not too long ago. And, uh, and we decided we wanted to come up with a couple of resources or at least one resource to really be able to help you begin to like, even like come up with a system to deal with some of that stuff. And, um, and so on your way out today, we're going to hand you a piece of paper, and you don't get to say no, okay? Um, we're going to hand it to you whether you want it or not, and um, you, you can choose to use it or not use it, but I spent money to print them, so you're going to take them, all right? Um, so uh, you, they're, they're what is called a grief and loss worksheet. And it's going to encourage you to go through your life at different periods of time, at different ages, when you were at different ages, and talk about experiences of grief and loss that you had in your life, potential moments of trauma that you had in your life, and what was your reaction to those things. And then it's going to challenge you to answer some questions about those kinds of things to help you really process like some of the things that have happened and some of the reasons why you are the way that you are so that you can take that before God and deal with those things. Because my guess is there are certain things that have happened in your life and in your past that you've never taken to God that you need to deal with. There are some of us who have experienced trauma at a young age or abuse at a young age and we've never gone to God and said, God, how could you have ever let that happen to me? And maybe we need to. Maybe, maybe that would bring us to a place of where we're finally able to lay it out there for God to begin to do some work in our lives and in our hearts that we really need done. 
in our lives and in our hearts. And so I want to challenge you to that. Another resource is my book that's in the lobby. Uh, you don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, it's, you know, it's up to you. But, um, but in there, there's a chapter on being pure in heart and how to cultivate a pure heart, like Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes. Um, and uh, in, in that chapter, it talks about the, the practice of lament. And it actually gives you a prayer that you can work through and walk through to practice actually un, like beginning to come comfortable with lament. It's a prayer I go back to a lot of time because that structure helps me. Like just to have that prayer written out and go, okay, God, I'm going to share with you how I feel about this right now. And I'm going to share with you how I feel about this right now. And, uh, and so there's that resource for you as well. Please, if you uh, want one, take one. Um, the... Uh, the other thing that this really reveals is the heart of someone who feels separated and far from God. And there are a lot of things that can make us feel separated and far from God. There is things of our own doing that can make us feel separated and far from God. Like we can chase after the idols. We can chase after the things and make them more valuable than they really are. We can turn them into gods that they're not meant to be and we can draw ourselves further away from God when we do that. Um, and we oftentimes do that. <laughs> There's also the aspect though of, of our own sin, dealing with our own sin and thinking of our own sin. And when we sin, instead of going to God to find grace and find mercy, we find ourselves moving further and further away from God because we don't think that he wants to have anything to do with a sinner like us. And so we can inflict this, this like separation from God upon ourselves because we choose to chase after lesser gods or because we live a life um, like that, that, that's, that's built up um, and defined by shame. Now, I wanna talk about the difference between guilt and shame because I think it's really important that we understand these things. Like, guilt is something that you feel when you've done something wrong, and I think it's from God, and I think it's from the Holy Spirit, and he's gonna convict you when you've done something wrong because he wants you to change, <laughs> okay? And, uh, but shame is not when you know you've done something bad, it's when you believe you are bad. And that has, uh, that's an idea that gets perpetuated a lot within a lot of different places, but including the church with bad theology that says, well, you're just a wretch. But I read in the Bible and I read that you are a image bearer of God. And I read that you are created in his image to rule and reign with him and bring his way of life here on earth as it is in heaven. That he wants to use you and empower you to be a force for his way of life and his kingdom. I read that in Psalm 8, that you were created just below the angels and that you were crowned with glory and honor. Now, are you good? No, you're not. <laughs> but you're not bad. God didn't say when he created you, oh, I see what I've created, and it's bad. He, he looked, he saw what he created, and said, that's very good. And there is a, there is a nature to you where, where because of your sin and because of this world, you are broken, but you are not bad. Your heart is broken, but your heart is not bad. God has placed desires within your heart for him and his kingdom and for his way of life. And it's just about unearthing those desires and living and walking in them. That's really meaningful and that's really powerful and that's really what you're called to. And I think, I think you and I, we need to embrace that because otherwise we just live in this place of shame. We hold on to shame and we feel like, well, I'm just a horrible person. God could never love someone like me. And that's not, that's not the story that we get from the scriptures. We get a God who loves us so much that even when we are sinners, he came and he died for us. Because he loves us. 
And so may we not live crippled by shame. May we allow guilt to drive us to become more like Jesus. And may we send shame flying out the door because it doesn't belong in the life of a believer. But there is also a sense of shame that comes because not just have we done things uh, to ourselves, but because other people have done things to us. And that's some of our story. Some of our story is, is that like I'm dealing with shame because someone did something to me or treated me in some way to reveal that I'm not worthy, that I'm not truly a valuable image bearer of God, that I'm not uh, beautiful and valuable to God. And because I've been treated in this way, I carry this shame that's been inflicted on me because of what someone else has done or the way someone else has sinned toward me. And committed sin against me. And I just want you to know I'm sorry if that's what you've been through. If that's what you've gone through. If that's what you've experienced. If you've experienced anything less than the love that you should experience from other image bearers of God who devalue you and say you're unworthy. God does not say that about you. But you may feel the shame of that and you may have drifted far from God because you feel like you're not worthy to be with him or in his presence and you may be wrestling with some of those things. I want you to know, like he wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to be connected to you. He wants to have um, a deep, intimate relationship with you and you are worthy to him or else he wouldn't have sent Jesus to save you and rescue you. But then there's also a sense of where sometimes the enemy attacks. Sometimes the enemy attacks and he tries to drive a wedge between us and God. He tries to really get between us and separate us from God and lead us into darkness. You know, I, I just recently heard of this analogy, but I really love it, and it's really meaningful and powerful to me because I think it, I think it has uh, touched my heart in a, in a really significant way. But it's that one of the things that the enemy is trying to do is he's trying to block out the light of God in our life. He's actually trying to bring about an eclipse over the light of God. That what he's trying to do is he's trying to somehow like get between us and the light of God and cause us to live in the darkness. And he's trying to eclipse that light in your life and he's trying to bring about things that will eclipse that light in your life and he's trying to keep you living and walking in darkness and depression and despair and anxiety and in struggle. He's trying to do those things and he is attacking and some of you or have been experiencing the enemy's attacks over and over and over again, and he has been continually eclipsing the Son of God in your life, and he has been continually driving himself between you and uh, God, and you are feeling further and further and further away. And then what this psalm expresses is that when that begins to take place, there is a deep, deep angst within us. That, that, that the further and further we feel from God and that we, we, um, we are from God, the more despair and struggle we tend to wrestle with and we tend to go through. But I think that there is, there is hope that Jesus has come That he is the light and life. And that the darkness cannot overcome him. It cannot overtake him. And so if we have Christ, we have the light of God in our life. That we can cling to and that we can hold to. And that we can go to at any moment. With whatever's on our heart. And he will never leave us or forsake us. 
And so if the enemy is attacking and he's trying to eclipse the light of God in your life, I, I, resist the devil and he will flee. Push back the enemy using, using the word of God, using other brothers and sisters and community that surround you Continue to, to fight against the shadows of the eclipse. Knowing that if you can get through it, the sun will come again. Don't quit and don't give up. Don't allow your shame or your despair or your depression or your anxiety to cause you to quit. But keep fighting. And keep going to God with those things. Pouring out your heart. And crying out to him day and night. I told you we're going to uh, memorize this verse together. And so uh, let's, let's do that. All right. Psalm 88 verse 1. I want you to take this to heart and remember it uh, for the rest of your life. I don't want it to be something you remember for a week. I want it to be something you remember for the rest of your life. So that in moments of darkness and despair, you can always go back to Psalm 88.1. And remember that the Lord, my God, is the one who saves me. And day and night I cry out to him. All right, so let's say that together. Ready? The Lord, you are my God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. All right, I'm going to say the first part and you say the second part, okay? Lord, you are my God who saves me. All right, now you say the first part and I'll say the second part. Go. Day and night, I cry out to you. All right, I'm going to take away some words. You ready? Here we go. Ready? Lord, you are my God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. How about a few more words? Let's take a few more away. Ready? Lord, you are my God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. Can we do it with no words? Let's try it. Lord, you are my God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. I hope you know that no matter what you're going through, day and night, you can cry out to the Lord and the God of salvation. And he will be your help and he will be your rescue. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you that you love us enough to come and save us when we are sinners. Um, God, I, I pray that you will instill in us a heart to come to you and cry out and lament those things that are um, difficult for us to be honest about, those things that are difficult for us to share. But God, if there's any place where we can be laid bare, it's with you. If there's any place we can go and not be despised or rejected, it's with you. If there's any place that we can go and wrestle with whatever we're struggling with, depression, anxiety, fear, it's with you. And so, God, I pray. I pray. As we cry out to you day and night, that you will come and that you will rescue us from our affliction. I pray that you will rescue those in this room who have been dealing with the loss and the pain and the grief. I pray that you will be with those who are walking in shame to know that you love them. And you are their hope and their strength. God, I pray for those who have been abused and who have been despised and rejected by others. Um, God, I pray that they will know that, that you love them, that you are gentle and humble in heart, and that you welcome them, and that you want to care for them, you want to, you want to walk with them, you want to um, show them just how much and how great your love is for them. God, I pray against the enemy. Right now in this place, God, I pray against the, the, the evil spirits that are at work 
in our world and in the lives of these people that are at work to try and block out your light in their life. God, I pray against the eclipse of, of the enemy that he tries to, that he tries to bring in between us and you to cause us to walk in darkness. I pray against apathy. And I pray against false ambition. And I pray against despair. And I pray against just lostness. I pray against the lies. I pray for you to come and restore our hope and reveal the truth so that we might always stay close to you and we might always stay by your side walking in your light living your life in Jesus name Amen